Hi guys and welcome to the show. I'm Lisa Akbiri, your hair doctor, and today I have lots of questions and I'm going to give you lots of answers. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. Um, the first question is, I'm just learning how important it is to keep your hair sh stretched to maximum, to max, oh, to minimize tangles and not. I am, I am not the best braider or twister. What other ways can I keep my hair stretched without having to pay someone to braid my hair weekly? Okay, it's not a big deal, guys. Twisting is easy. First, go on my website. You just want to get a, and, and there's a video on there, but you just want to get a big section, two sections, and this is all you're doing. Watch your hairline, and this is all you're doing. You're just turning and turning. You can do it. It does not have to be cute. My hair is not cute at night when I go to bed. And then I'm twirling, rolling it down your finger, tucking it, just like that. Making sure there's no pressure or stress on your hairline. That's a protective style and that's going to keep you, give you these defined little curls on the end because I still have relaxer. So you see that my little knot there, I'm going to leave it the whole show. It's easy. So you don't have to pay anyone. Just practice. Look at my video. Practice. Next question says she has three questions. And first she wanted to start by thanking me and for sharing this valuable information. You are so, so welcome. The first question, she said, I have heard you mentioned a hobo oil, mink oil. What are your thoughts on linolin as a possible sealant? Well, it depends. Now, if you're vegan or vegetarian, you're not going to want that because it's, linolin is made from sheep's wool. Um, you, then also linolin is very dense. It's very thick. So it's going to be very difficult to rinse clean. I wouldn't recommend linolin for that reason. And some people have allergies to that. So it just depends. So I wouldn't recommend it personally or professionally because I, I know that it does not rinse as clean. The next question is, my second question is, can shampoos containing phosphates be considered clarifying shampoos? Phosphate has been approved by the FDA. Um, there are a lot of things that may have been approved by FDA where people won't use them, but it's, I, I just don't think it being a problem, see it being a problem. Um, there's some pros and cons. There's what, let me tell you guys how I determine if a product is, a, is going to be a problem. I definitely want it approved or, or going to be harmful or going to not be a good ingredient, a raw material. Two several ways. One, I want to make sure that it's approved by the FDA. Then I want to make sure that it's not harmful to the body, to the environment, um, harmful to the skin, those types of things. And then I want to be sure that it does not destroy the hair. So when you look at the strand under the microscope, we have a very compact cuticle. The um, there's no tears, dehydration, in other words, moisture level dropping. So that's the way I determine. But there's so many opinions about shampoos and, and conditioners and what should be in them. And I just really want you guys to be comfortable. But I do tell you this, I have not found any problems with it. So that's my answer. All right, it says the next question. She says, I like using henna. And I've been using it for three or four months. Just give me a little, it just give me a little color and make my hair stronger. I, I'm always careful to rinse thoroughly in deep condition afterwards. Because the color deposits left by the henna, should I because they're left, should I be concerned with excessive drying going forward? Or should I pay attention to the delicate protein and moisture balance for my hair? Um, let me just say this. You said I like using henna. I've been using it three or four months and you still like it. Henna is a natural plant product, so it's okay. So I would say, yes, you could use it. Should you be concerned about the moisture levels dropping? 
you have not had that problem, after about seven weeks, you should have noticed. And usually in the first um, few weeks, you should notice buildup and dehydration and even the first use with some some hennas. So if you're you're doing okay, let's not break it because it's not, you know, let's not try to fix it because it's not broken. That's how I feel. All right. Hello. Next question. I am all natural. And but last summer I would blow dry and flat out my hair almost every day. Did you shampoo and condition every day? Hmm. That's my question to you. Of course, my hair broke off and was very damaged so I got I so I cut it off and you know that's what we do we damage it and we cut it we damage it, but you don't have to and you can use a flat iron without damaging but anyways let's go on to finish she said now I stop using heat only about once to once a month and I can feel that my right side of the head is thinner than the left how can I get the right side of my hair uh, here she's trying to say thick and healthy again and how do I gain and keep my length let me cut that off I forgot about my phone okay first with heated tools it's not how often you use it it's what happens on contact so you need to make sure you only use heated tools with clean hair and you need to make sure that you hydrate the hair prior to using the heated tool now to get the hair thicker You've got to, if you've lost the layers, you cannot put the layers back, so you can't build that texture back up. But you can, the new hair that's coming in, you can be careful, careful to protect and preserve it so that you don't have a problem with that new hair becoming thin again. And then you can slowly trim it away, but you can treat it if you decide you want to keep it because you can make it look fuller by deep conditioning, but it will not get thicker. It will not get the true texture back. Only the new hair. Okay, next question. I was wondering um, if you felt that there are any ingredients that are terrible and an absolute no-no in hair products. Well, and she goes on to say a couple of things about certain things. Well, I can tell you, this is what I look for in a conditioner and a shampoo. And I mentioned that earlier. I do look at how how it how it affects the hair and the skin. I try to pay attention to that. You want to keep it simple. You don't want to use conditioners that are not going to rinse clean. You won't, don't want to use shampoos that have a lot of um, condition any conditioners in it. You want to get a squeaky clean from your hair and a, uh, when you shampoo and when you condition. So I'll say that any of the waxy um, products, um, stay away from gels, stay away from mousse, stay away from just things that, that dehydrate. They go in and attack and dehydrate. So that's some of the things that, and I know this is a little vague, but hair is dead protein. And basically what you're trying to do with your hair is to protect and preserve it so that you can keep it on your hair and you can obtain length. And for those of you who want longer hair. And you just got to pay attention to how the hair looks and how the hair feels. And if you've lost and damaged your hair, then you've got to build that hair back up. You've got to regrow and you've got to obtain length and you've got to do things differently. And don't expect overnight success, but there are certain ingredients that m most of these ingredients that we're afraid of, I'll say that, are really not harming us as much as we think. Now, when we talk about ingredients that are harmful to the environment or to our body, then that's different. But when we're speaking of our hair, we need to really be careful to, to just really not be so afraid, but just stay away from your waxy your harsh, your dehydrating products and ingredients. And you won't know that with, with um, like someone asked about the line on. That's, you have to make a, diff, a, a, a determination here. Are you concerned about sheep's wool? It's, are you vegan? 
it's too dense. I wouldn't recommend it. A jojoba is more like skin oil and it's natural. So there are certain things. Are you going to hear me talk all the time? But I want you to do your research, guys. You can know, you'll can, you find this out for yourself. Believe me. And listen to some of the things I say and let that guide you. But you'll be okay. All right. Next one. And I know y'all want me to give you more answers. Do this. Don't do that. I do a lot of that. But some things I just, I really want you to do that research and be comfortable with your product. All right. Also, are your product, okay. Also, your product line promotes as being for any ethnic background, any hair type, and any hair texture. I don't think there was, I didn't think there was a product or product line that was universal and met the needs of every head hair. You know, a one size fits all. That's cute. I always thought that finding hair products were trial and error, and somewhat it is because not all products work for all people. Can you explain how your line claims to be the one size fits all? Okay, hair is basically made of protein. Maybe 3%, 2% moisture just to balance so it doesn't just break up and fall apart because protein that is made of is keratin and it's very hard substance. Your goal is to protect and preserve the hair. Hair has three layers cuticle cortex medulla. The hair has a different shape based on the way the follicle is curved and that's going to determine if it's straight or kinky and all the in-betweens. Now how do you use one line? What I remember when I formulated my product oof, many many years ago I remember doing some research and working for other companies product lines and one of the things that I found is there was a shampoo for dandruff, a shampoo for for um, color treated hair, a shampoo for, and a conditioner for that, and a wrapping lotion, a setting lotion, and they were all over the place. And I just felt it was unfair to the consumers. That's just how I felt. And I thought, is this really important? So I conducted a study called Scalp and Skin. I could, conducted a study on the hair, um, and that's how I developed and coin these disorders, short hair syndrome, follicular epidermis alopecia, um, and those kinds of things, and first degree skin damage. And what I found is that if you will cleanse the hair, stay in with an acidic pH, mild cleansing agents, then anybody can use it, even a baby. Straight hair, oily hair, matter of fact, in the study, the patients who had oily hair and the, that were using shampoos for oily hair would make their hair dry. But if they use a shampoo that's mild cleansing agents within the pH of their hair and scalp, they're everything balanced. People with dry hair who couldn't shampoo often, they did well with using a shampoo pH of their hair and scalp. They stay balanced. They didn't dry out because it was too alkaline or too acidic. So that's how I determined, oh, this is great. This is a good thing. And with the conditioners, if the person needed protein, well, of course, everyone needs protein and moisture. You've got to keep it balanced. There's a delicate level that must stay balanced. And that's how I determine conditioners. Support products, oils, and moisturizers, that's a support product. If you notice, whenever I speak about them, it's as needed, when needed. Dry hair will need more support products than oily hair. Um, you determine that based on, like with the oil, if it looks dull and you have a problem with sheen, you may need the sheen on your hair. To tie dry scalp, you should lubricate your scalp so it can seal in your moisture. Feel dry. You're going to need hydration, moisture on different levels. You're going to need it. So those are support products. And then your styling aids depend on what you need for styling, whether your hair is natural, relaxed, and that's how I determine. And that's what makes my product one size fits all. I love that. I love that. Okay, guys. Thank you so much. I'm Lisa Ackberry, your hair doctor. To God be the glory in Jesus. Keep the questions coming. I will talk to you guys real soon. Bye-bye.